In the early 1980s, the British music industry was in one of its periods of transition. The big album-selling rock bands of the 1970s, like Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd, had been overtaken by the punk generation and written off as dinosaurs. In the pop charts, American acts were dominant. Michael Jackson, Hall & Oates and the new queen of pop called Madonna. But in early 1984, three like-minded characters involved in the high-energy dance scene in the north of England, Mike Stock, Matt Aitken and Pete Waterman, decided to form a powerhouse trio. Their plan was to establish a songwriting, arranging, publishing and production house that would hop back to an earlier era and also have a distinctive sound. Stock, Aitken and Waterman went on to have over 100 top 40 hits, selling 40 million records. They took Mel and Kim to the top of the charts and made Warrington boy Rick Astley an international star. And a pair of Australians called Jason and Kylie turned their hit factory into a brand of British pop that dominated the charts for the next six years. Number 36. From 1984 to 93, Stock Aitken and Waterman scored 13 number one singles. The songs were upbeat and optimistic. They filled the dance floors of clubs and turned musical novices into teen idols. They were crowned the best songwriters in the country three years running. Stock Aiken and Waterman. But to their critics, they represented a general slide towards cheese and manufactured pop. Stock Aitken and Waterman were voted in one magazine reader's poll as the second worst thing about the 80s, behind Margaret Thatcher. When Stock Aitken and Waterman first got together in 1984, Pete Waterman was a former DJ and A&R man who'd already enjoyed a successful career signing acts, including Musical Youth, whose single Pass the Duchy had been a hit the previous year. Mike Stock and Matt Aitken had worked together in hotel cabaret bands, but had begun to do what they really wanted, to write and produce pop songs, as Mike explained to the BBC at the time. We had enough money in the bank to spend about 18 months to two years going for it and honing down production techniques and listening to what was going about. In July 84, Divine's chart entry, You Think You're a Man?, was part of a new era of high-tech, high-energy dance music. The successor to disco, it was supposed to be the fresh sound of the future. Whatever I do, wherever I go, I'm never coming back to you. you Hazel Dean, a former Song for Europe contender, was one of the scene's first stars. Whatever I do was written by Stock Aitken and Waterman, and really that was their first song as writers and me as their artist. And um, I I thought, God, who's this, who's this? So we started this frantic search for them. Someone who spotted their potential early on was dead or alive singer Pete Burns, who was determined to track down the producers and work with them. Once in the studio, the band soon learned that the producers were fully in charge, which caused friction though Mike Stock justified their approach. Most bands are difficult as well because what they really want is to sit with an engineer for six months and make an album, you know, toying around with sounds. Matt and I are musicians ourselves and we write the songs. We'd rather get on with the job. Despite the difficulties, 16 months into their partnership, Dead or Alive gave Stock, Aitken and Waterman their first number one hit with You Spin Me Round. It is such such a time of in, intense friction, you know. You practically come out and end up on tranquilizers, but that's not a bad thing. It's quite fun when you look back on it. But they're very antagonistic as people, and we're very antagonistic as people, so it's really uh, quite a bad vibe in the studio for all that time that we're in there. <laughs> Pop calling the girl. <laughs> well, let's hope we don't have too much of a bad vibe in the <laughs> studio. I'm joined by in the studio by two of the artists who were the products of Stock, Aitken and Waterman, hit factory of the 1980s. First of all, Sunita, originally from the States, who conquered dance floors with So Macho and Toy Boy. And from Salford, we're joined by Jason Donovan himself, who had four UK number one singles, including Especially For You, duetting, of course, with his neighbour's co-star Kylie Minogue. And with us, two are the Hit Factory's chief studio engineer, 
Phil Harding, and Pete Waterman himself from Stock, Aitken and Waterman, the hit factory. So, Pete, I must start with you. You were sort of bouncing around a bit listening to some of those old <laughs> hits. But what were you doing? Uh, let's let's talk f- with all of you about what you were doing before the hit factory actually sort of manifested itself. And what were your ambitions? Well, I'd been very successful with... Uh, a production company before, and I'd done Musical Youth, and I'd done uh, Bell Stars and Nick Kershaw, and I'd done the specials and Alvin Stardust and Guys and Dolls. And I'd met Phil Harding when he was a young engineer at the Marquee. So when we had the biggest number one in 83, which was Pastor Duchy by Musical Youth, I became very disenfranchised with the whole feeling of the music industry. It lost its excitement to me. So I went, I went personally away to, to America for a few months. The day I came back, I think, I got this phone call from a guy called Mike Stuck and a guy called Matt Aitken. They came in to see me and they played me the upstroke by um, agents on aeroplanes and I just knew that I'd found what I'd been looking for. I found two guys that actually were as cavalier as myself when it came to pop music. They just wanted to do something different. Phil Harding, who you just mentioned, is sitting next to you. And Phil, the marquee, that was... Uh, was that a club in Oxford Street? Uh, originally it was a club and a, and a studio was built behind it. Uh, I joined there in 73. The studio was quite established. And, uh, in fact, the first year of the Stock Aiken Waterman work was done at the Marquee. What did you think of the other two who weren't Pete? <laughs> Uh, they were great, yeah, as Pete says, very enthusiastic, very into pop. We immediately struck up a good relationship. Sunita, before you met um, these boys, what were you doing? Well, I was sort of doing Western theatre and I'd actually had one hit record and um, was spending a lot of my time with the young Simon Cowell, pestering Pete and his team to write me another hit. Because your mother was a, a disco artist, wasn't she? Yeah. You know, I grew up in her dressing room and backstage, trying on the costumes and the makeup since I was little. And Jason Donovan, you were a child actor, I think. I mean, you were in the business from a very early age in Australia. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I sort of uh, began my career uh, very young. My father is an actor. You know, I started in a, in a TV series called Skyways and my sister in that show at the age of 11, well, both of us at the age of 11, was Kylie. And, you know, my introduction, I guess, to, to the guys uh, at Stock Ake and Waterman was really very much on the coattails of, of the success that Kylie had had. Watching her sing, you know, in public and privately, and I... I sort of, you know, felt that maybe this is something I should develop. And and Phil and Pete, you you would have seen, particularly you, Phil, with the new technology, you, you would have seen the the possibilities of making records in an can I use the word an economical way and not spending months and months and months over them. No, it's true. When we arrived at PWL Studios, which Pete set up in, in the borough. We were at the edge of all the new technology: the latest drum machines, latest synthesizers, fantastic. Microphone. We only ever had one microphone in the studio. How many people did you actually need in the quotes band? None. It was just Matt and Mike. Yeah. We obviously had um, a collection of three backing singers that we we chose. But the point that I think that everybody forgets about Matt and Mike is they were exceptionally good musicians. Matt is probably one of the most accomplished guitarists I've ever worked with. Jason. Can I tell you a funny story? When, when I first came to the UK, I used to see on the back of the sleeves credits, and of course you had Matt and Mike and Pete and Phil, of course, and there, there, there was this character on drums called A. Lynn. <laughs> And I always thought, where is it? I can't wait to meet this guy. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I was a Lynn. A Lynn, the drum machine we used was a Lynn drum machine. But of course, the Musicians' Union insisted <laughs> that you had to have musicians on the record and they paid. So I got paid for being a drum machine on every record we ever made. And every time on top of the pop, so I used to get these checks to a Lynn. <laughs> but I, I would love to know more about your working methods and how they differed from everybody else's. You were concerned. Considered Pete, I think, as as quite an authoritarian person in the studio. You had, you know, people had to do things just so. Oh yeah, because we had a game plan. Our job was to make a record and move on, and that meant that the artist had turn up. We didn't want to talk to them. Get in the booth, <laughs> sing, and go. That's what you're here for. Do you know what? It was it was extraordinary because I was used to recording the old way and sitting in the studios with my mother the way she used to record, and it would literally take. 
days to record one song because everything had to be perfect. And I couldn't believe it the first time I recorded with them. And I was in the building. I was taught a song, recorded the song, and out of the building in 20 minutes. <laughs> the pop It was the just like, the... what? But I had no idea that a record could be made that quickly. It just changed my life because it was the new way of doing things. Was it the same for you, Jason? Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, I, I struggled. I found it a very sort of difficult process. I wasn't a naturally gifted singer. And I, and I totally get where the guys were coming from at the time. But from a from a sort of uh, confidence level, I guess, you know, some of my better recordings were probably cover versions, if I'm honest with you. It's interesting. Pete. I think Jason does himself a disfavour because I think Too Many Broken Hearts is one of the greatest pop songs we ever recorded. We had a belief that... It's not how good your voice is, it's how the tone of your voice, the character of your voice, and that to us is what we wanted. But also they would write the songs sort of bespoke for us, so you'd sort of have a little chat, even though he says he didn't want to talk to us. He did talk to us first, <laughs> and he'd say, how was your weekend, what have you been up to, what's going on? And he'd pick up a few things that came out, and he'd write a song around it so that the songs absolutely suited you as well. With Jason, we knew Jason was this heartthrob, which is why we wrote Too Many Broken Hearts. With yeah. Sunita, she made this quote in a newspaper about toy boys. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where it came from. It was them. Yeah. Did the huge success of You Spin Me Around take you by surprise? Um, did it take you by surprise, Phil? It was hard work, wasn't it, Pete, finishing the record <laughs> off, as Pete Burns was describing. Um, possibly <laughs> the longest mix session I'd ever done in my life. 36 hours we were in Oh, there. yeah. The bank balance was probably just above zero. Mm. I mean, if we hadn't delivered this, mm. in truth, it w would have probably gone. And when we were mixing, we made a mistake. Mm. Phil put a, uh, put a, an arpeggiator on, on one of the synths. An arpeggiator? Yes, that's the thing. It repeats. It, it's, oh, a, it's a pulse. Yeah. It's a delay. Mm. We'd forgotten it was on. So we'd mixed all night, and it was 10 o'clock in the morning. We were completely wrecked. And halfway through the track, I realised there was this little synthesizer going digga 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 digga, which wasn't supposed to be there at all. But Pete Burns was like a child; he lit up and he picked on this synthesizer. We're wait, that's brilliant! I kicked Phil and said, "Phil, shut up!" And that went on to be number one. And literally, if it hadn't been, we'd have been broke. No, I'm doing F, D minor, B-fat major 7, first time round, F, D minor, A, sus, the second time round, because that takes you into the G minor 7 verse, which is a good lift. It was great that showing that was specifically written for us, and when you listen to the verses, it's so us. At the start of 1986, two cool East London girls arrived at the studio door. Sisters Mel and Kim Appleby turned out to be just what they needed. Now, as sisters growing up, did you used to like to sing and dance together? Yeah, we sing a lot together. Well, yeah. Well, we still do that. <laughs> I remember the day we went into the studio to record the second single, and up on the screen was respectable. Take or leave us, honey, please believe us. We ain't ever going to be a respectable. Take or leave us, only please believe us. We ain't ever going to be respectable. Stock Aitken and Waterman's skills impressed Simon Cowell, then of Fanfare Records. Cowell wanted Pete to produce a song for his artist, Sunita. I always thought the mix between Sunita and Stock Aitken and Waterman would be amazing. It was a relationship that worked, and I think it was great for Sunita and it was great for me. And Stock Aitken and Waterman's record, Toy Boy, with Sunita, reached number four in the charts. Stock Aitken and Waterman might sound like a firm of solicitors. With all their chart successes, there was a growing interest in the men behind the hits. But what is the secret? Do you have a, a formula for a, a good pop song? Purely down to hard work. I was a new artist, nobody had ever heard of me, and if you were going to release me, say, two months or a month before Christmas, it would have done probably nothing. That summer, after over a year of nurturing their new act, Stock, Aitken and Waterman were ready to release onto an unsuspecting public a young man with ginger hair and a good voice called Rick Astley. Dave Warwick was Rick's first manager. It went on a BBC Northwest local news programme and we never looked back. He just went... Pff. In August 87, the young singer found himself on top of the pops. 
His debut single, Never Gonna Give You Up, knocked Michael Jackson off the top of the charts and stayed there for five weeks. Rick Astley was very important for Stock Aitken and Waterman, wasn't he, Pete? Uh, oh, absolutely, um, because Rick was family. Um, Rick had come to us on a youth opportunity training programme at 40 quid a week. And, you mean uh, he didn't cost you anything? He cost me nothing. The government paid him to be a pop star. <laughs> and uh, he shared my flat in North London. He makes great toast. And um, he went on to conquer the world. And, you know, one of the things that we really believed in and we'd learnt right at the very beginning with Divine, you need to shock your audience. And we knew that when people saw Rick Astley on top of the pops, they would gasp and go, my God, who is this? He sounded like a, a black singer, didn't well, he? Well, everybody the rumour in the studio was, of course, it was Luther Vandross. Yeah. And I, I, a year later, I sat at a Hollywood Bowl with Whitney Houston. I always remember it because she said to me, oh, he's so cute, I just want to hug him. You know, and that is Rick Astley. I thought he was adorable. And the same thing when I first heard it, I thought it was Luther too. You know, and I think we all did look look up to him, even though actually he was just a kid as well. Jason. Look, never going to give you up really, for me, changed the landscape of, you know, popular music. I, I just fell in love with that melody to this day. It gives me shivers when I hear that Mr A. Lynn and, and those <laughs> drums come in at the beginning and those strings. It, it yes. just is such an incredibly well-crafted pop song. I wonder, Phil Harding, if you think, as some people do, that um, it was the sort of catchy beat that reflected the optimism of the times in the 80s, because the 70s had, in Britain had been quite difficult to live through for many people. Yeah, the whole the whole Stock Aiken Waterman sound and vibe was a complete match to the 80s, positivity, uh, you know, everything that was going on. I don't think a negative record was ever made in the building, was it? No, and, and, and also, <laughs> because I'm a ra I was a radio DJ, I realised, of course, the most important thing was to come out the news. You know, that's why it goes... Because you're coming out in the news. And at three o'clock, that's the news, over to George. He was into his radio programme. And it didn't matter that the um, sort of upbeat was in stark contrast often to what they'd heard on the news. No, it actually was the, the, the antidote. What are your memories, Sunita, of um, hanging around with Simon Cowell at the time? I mean, he, he, he was always everywhere, wasn't he, listening to everybody and spotting yes. talent? It was really exciting because, you know, he had this, this label that was just a small label... Um, I was the only artist. And once we had this partnership with, um, with, with Pete and, and the guys, it was like we were really in the music business. Everybody was young and fresh. It was like being right at the cutting edge of the new happening. But, but, but for me, I, 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 I would argue, I, I guess as well, you know, which we see a lot of these days is, you know, the currency of being on television and that marriage between the emotional connection of, you know, a Scott and a Charlene and, and a great pop record, you know, was the perfect storm, <laughs> really. But, but and off, off we went, you know, it just went nuts. Jason, don't you think after, I mean, after, too many broken hearts. Did you did you feel that you feel more confident as a singer? Like the validation of having such a massive hit with that. Yeah, I, I, I just girls I, fainting. I, yeah, no, I, I did. <laughs> I, I just think I probably came in from a very sort of different route. I mean, I think it was uh, Pete's idea, particularly with my career, which was. Um, you, you know, a very clever idea was to put me on the Hitman and Her Roadshow, oh, yeah. uh, which was basically <laughs> 20 or 30 dates, I think, over a summer. Was yeah. it Pete? I yeah. can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and the, I guess the idea of it was, you know, you had someone like myself headlining it, you know, you know and cause chaos and mayhem and create yeah. this, <laughs> this, well, this sort of situation. We used to jump situation. on stage and do backing vocals for him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were all touring around together doing on a, these... On one bus. On one bus. We We'd had a great tour the first time around, you know, it had gone really well, very successful. And then the next time we had Jason Donovan headlining. And oh my goodness, suddenly so many kids turning up to literally girls fainting, screaming, crying just at the sight of him. Can I just say something? I think one, of the, one, of, 
one of I think one of the really interesting points here about about Stockache and Waterman and and what was going on I think was these guys and particularly through your, yourself Pete manage to create a, 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 an incredible marketing moment that I don't think the music industry ever really came to terms with you know <laughs> they, there was a vision of it being uh, might I say the word business operation so therefore we maximise our potential in any sort of way and I think the rest of the industry couldn't really come to terms with that. At that point, when an artist had had a number one, then the agent went into the record company and they booked a tour and they went out on tour and it was £27.50 to get in and it was a 13 quid for the programme and (laughs) there were four other hopeful acts on the programme. We did differently. We said, right, we'll do... 27 dates from Aberdeen in the north and we'll pick cities like Barnsley where no pop tour goes and it'll be a pound to get in. What did they get get for that as well? They got a free drink and a free eat, a a burger. That's right. And, (laughs) and, 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 you know, when we made news at 10 for the riots that were going on, people said, well, how did you do that? I said, hang on, I took the biggest pop star in the world, Jason Donovan, and put him on in Barnsley. To me, it was obvious, but the record industry was going, well, you you couldn't make any money at this. And we go, of course you make money at it because we're selling all these millions of albums. <laughs> all the way from Australia, please welcome Jason Donovan! Jason Donovan sold over three million records in Britain. He had four UK number one singles, one of which was Especially For You, his duet with Kylie Minogue. Especially for you. Jason Mania began to sweep the country. On his tour, it was reported that teenage girls were fainting at the rate of one a second. Mark Frith worked at teen music magazine Smash Hits when it enjoyed its biggest ever sales for one issue. It kind of reached a peak when Smash Hits put Kylie and Jason on the cover of the week, especially for you, went to number one. And it was the highest selling issue of Smash Hits ever. Just under a million copies were sold that fortnight. It was just astonishing. <laughs> In Australia, Kylie had been signed by Mushroom Records, who'd already recorded her cover version of Little Eva's The Locomotion for the domestic market. When no British label wanted to release her next song, I Should Be So Lucky, Waterman put it out on his own newly formed PWL label, and Kylie seemed delighted. They've got their own style of music, so it's worked very well. Locomotion was a really heavy dance song, and... um, I didn't want to go to the other extreme and have something slower or a ballad or something. So it was a nice medium. It wasn't quite as fast, but I should be so lucky is just what I wanted. Broadcaster and chart expert Paul Gambaccini. They got lucky with Kylie. They had to inevitably find their own little princess, and she was it. Managing director of PWL International, David Howells. Kylie was amazing to work with, total professional, able to dance, work to a camera, because that was her training. All the time we were apart, I thought of you. You were in my heart, my love never changed. It's interesting... Phil Harding, that considering how enormous Kylie became in the Stock Aitken Waterman fold uh, and Jason too, how she arrived unrecognised in your headquarters first time around. Tell us about that. We were having one of our many birthday celebrations. So there was Kylie sitting in the corner of reception uh, on her own. So I went over and uh, I didn't recognise her. And I don't, I don't think many of the other staff recognised her because of the time of day Neighbours was on. We, we were all... Working. Okay. And then she said, yeah, I've come over here to make a, a record with Stock Egg Waterman and uh, just waiting to get into the studio. At that point, when I first met Kylie, she's sitting in the reception doing some basket work. And, you know, you walk past You mean past basket the, weaving? Yeah, you know, basket weaving. You know, that's what she's like. Matt, I think, was one of the very first person that spotted Kylie had this very unique voice that you could instantly recognise. It was the voice again. That gave us all the confidence we needed. How did... I should be so lucky. Come about. The thing was, we, you know, we, we, you know, everybody goes, but you wrote these songs in twenty minutes. Of course we did, but it took us fifty years to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, we'd all been in the business for probably twenty years each at that time. So by the time we came to, I should be so lucky. We were in a groove. 
we'd got enough ideas that we could lash a song together very quickly and make it work. How did you think of the title? Because I was on the phone from Manchester or from Warrington, and I said, you know, you better send her home. He said, well, she can't. She's, she can't come back to She can't come back from Australia. I said, well, she should be so lucky. And that wasn't unusual, was it, Phil? No. I mean, so many of our titles came from something that somebody said in the studio at the time, and we went, that'll do. That's what we were like. We go, there's a title, got it. Now write it. Jason. Well, I always felt that Mike was driving the, the, the songwriting process a lot. Um, he would find those melodies that would unlock a place in your heart that just uh, uh, blew me away. Uh, Sunito, was there a sort of jealous pang occasionally when you saw that this young Aus- Australian couple were getting all the attention, or wasn't it like that for you? Yeah, I, I definitely, especially Better the Devil You Know. Um, I actually adored Kylie, and we we toured together in in Japan. But when she got better, the devil you know. Even though it was written for her, I can remember calling. So I begged, I cried, I screamed. You know, when you just hear a song and you know that it's for me, it was like I just knew that this song was saying everything that I wanted a song to say at the time and the beat and it was sort of more mature and I remember sort of thinking, but Kylie's kind of sweet and I'm kind of more the wild child. Please give me that song. And a lot of Phil. people ask me, how did you get that Kylie sound? Because there, were no, there was no auto-tune, there was no computer editing possibilities in those days. And the, yeah. and the amazing thing about uh, people like Kylie and, and I guess with Jason as well, you just... It's like you'd nail a line and you could nail it again and again and we'd often triple track. Yeah. I, I certainly don't remember any singer that we ever worked with ever taking more than 25 minutes to record a track. Whether it was Donna Summer, whether it was Cliff Richard, <laughs> whether it was Banana Rama, whether it was Sunita, they had 20 minutes yeah. because literally we wanted a performance. We didn't want time and t- for hours... You go in there, you sing this song, you sound fresh, you sound exciting, because that's what we're selling. Sometimes the best takes, as an actor as well, are usually the first and second take. Mm. So, you know, this this process of doing it 30 or 40 times over, you know, might Kills be self, self-gratifying for the director or, 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 or the actor himself because he thinks he's going to get something better, but actually maybe he's not the judge <laughs> um, of who is the best performance or not. Sonia's hit You'll Never Stop Me Loving You became the producer's sixth number one in 1989. There was even a collaboration with 70s disco diva Donna Summer. Paul Gambaccini again. For me, their greatest record is the Donna Summer. This time I know it's for real. In January 1990, the Hit Factory enjoyed their 13th number one hit with Kylie's cover version of the 50s ballad Tears on My Pillow. But it was to be the trio's last number one hit together. At the beginning of the 90s, the music of Stock Aitken and Waterman began to feel a bit dated and fair game for the likes of French and Saunders, who parodied Kylie's hit I Should Be So Lucky in their own television show. In my imagination, <laughs> I dream about you all the time. Jason and Kylie were brought in to defend their record. The thing is, sometimes people tend to take them as just people that press buttons and just machine whatever they're going to do. But Perhaps in 20 years' time they'll sit back and say, yeah, yeah, that were geniuses. I yeah. mean, it'll take them 20 years to realise. Really. As the hits dried up, so did the partnership. Stock Aitken and Waterman were embroiled in a row about the division of the spoils and would never work again as a trio. Matt Aitken... Pete, Mike, uh, Mike and I, we never had a contract. We never even particularly shook hands and said, hey, let's work together forever. It just happened. And, you know, one thing Mike and I are, if, you know, if we have our demons, we're both very loyal people. And um, we believed that as we were giving Pete a third of our songs, that, that he, he would be giving us a third of the copyrights in the recording side. Pete had a counter-argument and said, well, look, I paid for all this. And we said, hang on, you only could pay for that because we were doing the work to bring the money in in the first place. That was Matt Aitken. And, Pete, how do you see the reasons for the split? Um, you, you probably regret them, but was it a, about a misunderstanding well, about the original was... terms, no contract, that sort of thing? No. By that time, I think that... Um... We'd lost all 
touch of reality. Money dries up creativity. Instead of turning up to work five days a week, working from 11 o'clock to 9 o'clock every evening, uh, Monday to Friday, suddenly Matt had gone motor racing one day a week or two days a week, Mike was golfing. So I had 63 people on the payroll. You know, people had got married since we started the company, had houses and their mortgages. I had a responsibility to pay these wages every month. So it looked great from the outside. On the inside, you know, I'd got the bank every month ringing me up to make sure the money was in to pay all the wages. You know, you just know that um, things move on. Artists uh, want to move on and they want to do different things. And I just think you personally accept. And I wanted to move on, to be quite honest. So I just had had enough. I was worn out. At the end, I was glad to see it move on. You were ambitious for something else to happen. It didn't need to because you'd made so much money, but what, what direction did you I just want wanted, to go? In? I wanted to start again. I wanted to do it all again. This was the most amazing thing we'd ever done. It wasn't about the money for me. It was about could we do it again, and we did. Phil Harding, do you believe him when he says that? Oh, no, absolutely. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, people have asked me, was money the motivation? Uh, Peter, we are on uh, uh, within the whole team, and it wasn't definitely not. Music was the motivation, and 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 to be successful with that music, and 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 that brought the money. But uh, you know, for me, towards the end of uh, what you're calling the glory days, was really like the change of the decade as yes, well. It was, yeah. You know, I think I think the media and the fans and everybody wanted a different sound, and and we tried. Yeah, I remember trying many different sounds and going funkier with Kylie and all the rest of it but uh, as Pete says I think that the team had found a natural that team at that point found a natural kind of finish around the end of the decade really I think every Jason. every every culture every popular culture and every movement has a sort of uh, 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 a cycle and there is a rebellious nature against you know punk or you know as you came out of the late 80s you know suddenly Nirvana started to kick off in 1992 yeah. so it rebelled against you know the the sort of the shoulder pads and the big hair and you know yeah, I think it, everything changed and it's it? supermodels you know suddenly it was the Kate Moss sort of wave look. There was a lot of jealousy against us and, and, and weird because it wasn't just, it was, you know, from adults, it was from media as well who was sort of jealous of the rain, I suppose. So they wanted it to end. You know, you could almost hear the reluctance sometimes in the, in the radio DJs when they had to play, you know, five Hit Factory records in a row because we're dominating the charts. It wouldn't be like, wow, this is incredible, they've done it again. It would be like... OK, and here they are again, and, you know, just a bit irritated. And, and I, I, think it was, I think it was jealousy, I really do. Phil, what's yeah. your take on it? I wouldn't call it jealousy. I'd call it kind of a, a, a backlash against pop. When uh, my production partner, then Ian Kerno, and I left, I've never told Pete this, you know, quite a, quite a number of clients uh, that we'd worked with over the years actually said to us, oh, you know, thank God you've left there now, we can work with you again. <laughs> and I was like... You, they didn't want to be tagged with, with mm. the pop name and, and pop sound anymore. I mean, the amount of meetings that I went to and people said, they've called me in to talk to them about their act. Do you do anything else? What do you mean? Do, well, do, you, do you make some records that don't sound like Stock Aitken Waterman? Well, if you want a non-Stock Aitken Waterman record, why have you called me in? Sometimes, like in the, in the people in the record industry, they, they, they listen to a song and they go, oh, it sounds too much like a hit. Oh, yes. OK. Well, that's a problem then. What do we do now? So sorry about that. Pete, do you think sometimes your, your um, rather controlling personality also put them off? They didn't you know, necessarily want to work with you? or what? No, I think it was my honesty. We didn't kid anybody. This was honesty. And I think when you know, you're earning a million pound a month or a million pound a week then other people come in and want a piece of it. You didn't only, of course, work with British stars and Australian stars. Donna Summer was absolutely huge in those days, still is in many people's minds. Uh, did she get your method of working? I met Donna. I knew Donna's husband very well. And I met her with Rick Hasley round the pool at the Beverly Hills Hotel. And she asked, would we make a record with her? She came over. And, of course, she'd never worked with anybody like us. But she had belief in what we did and said, you know what, I love it. I'm going back to California for a couple of weeks, write a few songs and I'll come back and sing them. And you know what, she was the most delightful. You know, we were great friends up until, until her death and still friends with the family. 
Donna Summer took our songs to a different level because here was a diva. So here we were, three lads from, from Britain, that just suddenly found this diva that could sing anything we chucked at her. And could she do it in 20 minutes? In 10 minutes. <laughs> and in fact, the staff's real treat, the real treat for the staff was she used to warm up in the ladies' toilet. And when she used to warm up, the whole building stopped work because all that everybody wanted to hear was Donna Summer warming up. She was unbelievable. Well, there's nothing like a toilet for great reverb. <laughs> <laughs> when you sing in a toilet, it always sounds fantastic. <laughs> That's all I need to say about that. But no, those Donna Summer records were great, and you know, look, I think every you know artist there is a cycle, I guess, and you know, and I think you know Stockake and Waterman had a cycle of their own, and of course things move in in, in different ways. Sounds move in different ways too, you know. I think um, you, I think you've got to be grateful for the moment, but but having someone like Donna Summer come along and endorse that sound really helps elevate you on to another level. Yep. And the pop world was, was really changing in other respects, Anita, wasn't it? Because um, amateurs were coming along onto television shows in sort of competitive shows. It's on the voice, the attention, but in a very different way. These are untrained people, a untrained lot of them. Untrained people. Yeah, in a way, I, I think um, the talent shows were almost taking what the Hit Factory did with us and a, a sort of modern-day version of it because it discovered new, fresh talent and let the public speak for themselves, let them decide who they want to listen to and whether they're going to buy their records or not. So, And a new way of doing things, and they launched them on television, so where he'd take us around the country and say they don't have to be multi-platinum album-selling artists yet. The kids like them, here they are, and gave back to the public. I think the talent show did the same thing. And moving into the present time, uh, Phil, um, you know, digital technology has changed so much from when you were first recording um, yeah. that r really um, the record business has changed utterly. Well, the technology has basically opened up recording and, and record making for everybody, you know, from bedrooms through th still to professional studios. So, so therefore, record company budgets have gone down because they, you know, most musicians around the world know how to record themselves. A modern pop producer now often won't be in the same room as the musicians So anymore. who makes the money out of the music business now? Always Pete. the same, the record industry. <laughs> Still, <laughs> nothing changes. Well, we're dominated by by three major labels now. But but really, if you want to be one of those international, worldwide stars coming out of the UK, like an Ed Sheeran, like an Adele, uh, a Sam Smith, you, you you've you've still got to go through one of those majors for their huge international marketing and promotional push. Pete Waterman. Well, recently there was a court case. The Marvin Gaye family uh, was suing Robin Thicke for blurred lines. And in court, the papers that were put into court, so that this was the record company putting the evidence in, $15.6 million. Well, I have to tell you, this is a new phenomenon because in all our history, I never saw a single sell £15.6 million pounds worth or dollars worth of records. So this is a different industry now. So, well, I have to ask, where does it come from and who does it go to? Well, so at this moment in time, the jury's out. It, we presume that a lot of it is electronic, um, digital uh, sales that nobody knew has existed. Or have the record companies always had this enormous figure that we've never seen as artists and as record producers. Mm -hmm. So, Anita, are you glad that you were prominent in the era when you were rather than now? I had a great time and it was fantastic to be part of something at that stage in my life because it was about young people, it was about new technology, new sounds, new music. I mean, I'm looking at even at the, the Hit Factory album, <laughs> just oh. looking how what we're wearing and how we're posing. And it's what do just... you make of yourself? You're not wearing very much in that photograph. I'm not wearing, yeah, not very much. Yes. <laughs> I see what people mean now. I mean, it was just creative and fun. Jason there with long hair. Looking very pretty, Jason. I remember those days. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you look back on them now, Jason? Uh, really fondly, you know, and I, I'm very privileged and very lucky to have been part of songs that, you know, um, made people smile and made people happy. Do you and miss the screaming girls of Barnsley? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You know, for us, it was just great fun. And we didn't want to be posh. 
We wanted to be that girls could come up to us and touch us. You'd get Jason to breathe into a jar and lock it down and put the bottle. You know, <laughs> Is that what Jason, they do? yes, Jason's breath. <laughs> <laughs> wow, not many people get that once in a lifetime, you know. And I and I feel very grateful for that experience, you know. And me too. Me too. I mean, I'm privileged to work with these guys. They were hugely talented. It was, you know, 12, 14 years of our life. You know, that, that we did take the world on. Any regrets at all about how it went? No. Nah. I wish I could do it all again. I'd start tomorrow. If I had to do it all again. <laughs> <laughs> what should we play out on, do you think, Pete, out of all those amazing tracks? Roadblock. Roadblock, why? Yeah, because it broke the mould. It was so different from what we were doing that it was really a a stab at our people that thought we that we were just this one thing. Um, and they said, we can do anything we want to do. But also because it's like the whole team, you know, and the three guys together again as well. Sorry. <laughs> Sinita, Pete Waterman, Jason Donovan, Phil Harding... Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. The Reunion was produced by Emily Williams and the series producer is David Prest. It was a Whistledown production for BBC Radio 4.